Uh, first of all, thank you, Michael and Hannah, and thanks to the museum for asking me to speak today. Um, I have to apologize in sort of a funny way for the fact that my co-author, Helen Azar, isn't present today. She lives outside of Sydney, Australia, where it is about five o'clock in the morning tomorrow. And as anyone who knows her knows, she is really a night owl. But she sends her best. And if we get any crazy questions at the end that I can't answer, I'm happy to pass them on to her, or you can look at her Facebook page in the steps of the Romanovs and look at a lot of the wonderful things that she has been posting. I think I have to start this off by talking a little bit about the manuscript diary. <clears throat> Uh, Michael Romanov, who, as everybody knows, was the younger was a younger brother of Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, kept a diary, but he did not keep it in the same way as most of the Romanovs did. He kept notebooks and he jotted things down bit by bit every day. And at the end of the day, he would turn them over to his secretary, Nikolai Johnson, who was a Russian of British extraction, and he would type them up. And the next day, Michael would make notes in the margins or slight corrections, and then the papers would be bound together. Those manuscripts after the death of Grand Duke Michael, which we'll go over at the end of the lecture, uh, those manuscripts were returned to his wife, Natalia Brasova, and she smuggled them out of Russia to England, where they remained with her family for many years. Natalia kept the manuscripts with her in Paris, and they were inherited by her daughter, Natalie Mamonte, Mamontova Gray Majolier, she was married several times, who found the manuscripts propping up her mother's bed after her death. The manuscripts were sold by the family privately through a dealer ultimately uh, selling them to the Forbes collection in New York where they sat for many many years. No translation was ever done of them and the first uh, really appearance of sections of the um, diaries became known in Michael and Rosemary Crawford's book uh, Michael the Last Tsar, Michael the Second the Last Tsar. Uh, but the book had never been published in English in its entirety and the Forbes has sold the book in 2009 to the National Archives in Russia, where the manuscript exists today, and where my colleague, Helen, came across them <coughs> excuse me, several years ago on her last trip to Russia. So she said what we should do is a translate, an annotated translation of these diaries in the same way that we had done Grand Duchess Tatiana and which she had done also for Grand Duchess's Olga. And um, we thought terrific, but work held us up and it really wasn't until the pandemic that I was able to complete my end of the deal and get the annotation research done. So the book was published this year. This lecture, which we're about to have, is going to uh, cover an enormous amount of material, and probably the last third is going to be the most devoted to the work that we did on the book, but I felt that it was very important for everybody to have an overview of the life of Grand Duke Mikhail, and uh, so without further ado, I will start the lecture. So Michael was born on the 22nd of November, 1878, at the Anchkov Palace in St. Petersburg. He was the fifth and penultimate child of Alexander III and his wife, Empress Maria Fyodorovna. He was 10 years younger than his older brother, Nicholas II, and seven years younger than his older brother, Grand Duke George. When you're children, a decade makes a huge difference. And so Michael was really far more frequently in the company of his sisters, Grand Duchess Ksenia, who was three years older, and Grand Duchess Olga, who was three and a half years younger than he was. Grand Duke Mikhail was known in the family as Misha. You can see here a wonderful family group of photographs, which now belongs to the Russian History Museum. It's in our collection. It descended within the family of the Council Sufyev and was a gift to the museum in 2009. Michael was a lively little boy. He enjoyed torturing his sisters. Uh, he was universally adored by his family and close relatives and was known for the fact that he was so genial and natural and unaffected. Count Vita noted, um, and he observed the imperial family very closely for many years. He said, most of all, Emperor Alexander III loved his son Mikhail Alexandrovich. Why anyone loves one person above another is a mystery of the soul, and so it would therefore be difficult to explain why Alexander III loved his son Misha so much, but the fact is, he loved him most of all, without any question. All of the children of Alexander III were, I will not say terrified of their father, but they were humble before him and they felt his supreme authority. Only Mikhail Alexandrovich was the one who was completely natural and unafraid of his father in any way, and for this the emperor was grateful. 
The adolescent Mikhail was therefore a bit coddled and was certainly the favorite baby of the family, though as he grew older, he began to exhibit the sort of brusque toughness uh, that was a hallmark of Romanov men. He adapted well to tutoring at home and began to chafe at restrictions to his liberties. He had a tendency to slam around the palaces noisily and irritated his sister, Grand Duchess Olga, by storming into her room and throwing himself into chairs or onto her bed. She began to call him floppy in English for his his behavior, and uh, the nickname stuck within the family. In 1894, Mikhail was just 16 and preparing to enter military school when his father, Alexander III, became deathly ill and finally died in the Crimea at the old Livadia Palace on 19th October. He was only 49 years old, his son Nicholas was only 26, and Mikhail found himself second in line to the throne after his older brother, the Tsisadievich and Grand Duke George Alexandrovich. After the death of Alexander III, Maria Fyodorovna and her family withdrew permanently to the Anichkov Palace in Gatchina, leaving the imperial suites at the Winter Palace to Nicholas and Alexandra, the new emperor and empress. Mikhail, then 17, joined the Imperial Artillery School and joined the Lifeguards Artillery for military training, which was so crucial to the education of every Russian Grand Duke. Mikhail was not much of a student, but he was an excellent and instinctive soldier and they impressed all of his colleagues with his sort of natural physical abilities. Mikhail became a superb equestrian, a near professional shot, and he was much encouraged by the older members of the family, such as Grand Duke Vladimir and Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich, who urged him to work hard to serve the emperor. By his early 1920s, Mikhail was one of the rising members of the Romanov family and very useful to Nicholas II. He traveled extensively, was the public face of the family at family events, and became well known to the members of the extended international family of the Romanovs, which included the royal houses of Great Britain, Denmark, Greece, Hesse, and Prussia, and became familiar with relatives such as his cousins in Saxe Coburg Gotha, Hesse Darmstadt, Saxe Altenburg, and elsewhere. In 1898, there was an enormous shift, however, when the Michael's older brother, the Tsisadevich and Grand Duke George, died as the result of a motorcycle accident near Abbas Tumani in Georgia, where he had lived for several years as a result of the tuberculosis that he acquired on a trip to Asia with his brother in the 1890s. The funeral of George proved to be a turning point for Mikhail because with the, de the death of George Alexandrovich, Mikhail was now Tsisadevich and Grand Duke, his brother's heir. With this responsibility, Michael was thrust into a political world he had never really been meant to navigate, but in the middle of which he would uncomfortably remain for the rest of his life. By 1900, the Tsisadevich and Grand Duke Mikhail Alexandrovich was at the center of everything in St. Petersburg. He was young, he was handsome, he was powerful, he was next in line for the throne. He had love and the admiration of his family, he was respected by his regiment, and he lay very lightly on the political scene and made no enemies. He appeared to want for nothing and to ask for nothing. He was a soldier who served his brother, and though honors came, he never put himself forward for anything. The very astute Grand Duke Konstantin Konstantinich noted, Misha keeps away from affairs of state, never offers his opinions, and perhaps hide behind, hides behind the public's perception of him as a good-natured and unremarkable boy. It was precisely this quality of Michael's that made him such an interesting subject for Helen and for me. Publicly, Michael was always very quiet and reluctant to speak for himself or be quoted. He left a very small record of official statements or public appearances, Oh, oh, people are asking me to speak slower, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be difficult because there's a lot of material to cover. <laughs> as a result, um, the fate of his diaries were, uh, as we mentioned, were unknown for 50 years. They were unpublished for almost 100 years. And as a result, people have and continue to project onto Michael what they want to believe about him. As a result, there are a lot of myths and fabrications, even from the people who were closest to him. Our translation of his diaries from the most important period of his life, the war and the revolution until his death, are a way for us to try to move away from that and to restore his voice and his opinions to him and to eliminate some of the myths which follow him around. Mikhail's rise coincided with the apogee of Romanov power and influence. Here's another piece from the Museum of Russian History's collection. We have a copy of the extraordinary book of photographs that Sergei Levitsky compiled of the guests at the last great ball held at the Winter Palace, known as the Boyar Fete of 1903. And this is a detail of Michael's sumptuous costume as a 17th century Sisadievich. 
On his hat, this is a fun fact, he wears two important pieces from the Russian imperial crown jewels, which were borrowed for the occasion from his mother. And he has gone down in history as having lost the large diamond spray you see at the top. His sister Olga was quoted in her memoirs as saying, Michael lost it. It must have fallen off his cap while he was dancing. My mother and he were in absolute despair, the clip having been from the crown jewels. All of the halls at the palace were searched that very night. At dawn, the detectives searched from basement to attic. The diamond clip was never found. Poor Mikhail has been blamed for enough um, over the years, so I'd actually like to absolve him of this once and for all. You can see here a picture in the side box of the jewel in question. You can compare it. You can see it's the same one that he's wearing on his cap. This photograph was taken in 1924 by the Soviets. So we know that the jewel was definitely returned to the diamond treasury between 1903 and 1914, when the crown jewels were sent to Moscow for uh, safety during the First World War. I have to thank my Instagram friend, Russian underscore treasure, for bringing this to my attention. If you don't follow, I think you should. There's a lot of wonderful Russian jewelry history going on there. That event aside, it was to be the last ball at the Winter Palace, though nobody knew it at the time. By 1903, Grand Duke Mikhail was considering his future and the possibility of marriage. Marriage was an important moment in the lives of the male members of the imperial family, and the fundamental laws of the Russian state noted Grand Dukes could only marry women of equal birth, that is, members of a reigning or formerly sovereign house. And by this time, Mikhail had met and fallen in love with just such a woman. Princess Beatrice of Saxe Coburg and Gotha was, on the surface, a perfect match. She was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria and a granddaughter of Alexander II. Her father had been the Duke of Edinburgh and had inherited the Duchy of Saxe Coburg in 1893. Baby B, as she was known, was the youngest of four beautiful sisters, and Mikhail and Beatrice had a passionate epistolary relationship which went on for years. They were madly in love, but there was one impediment. They were first cousins. The Russian Orthodox Church prohibits marriage between relatives to the seventh degree. This means a complete ban on marriages between siblings, aunts and uncles, first cousins, first cousins once removed, second cousins, and second cousins once removed. Spiritual family members are also included, meaning you cannot marry a godchild of one of your parents, even if they are not related to you by blood. This religious canon, however, was moot if the, if the marriage was permitted by the emperor. First cousins, first cousins once removed, and second cousins married all the time in the house of Romanov. In fact, Nicholas and Alexandra were second cousins. Grand Duchess Elizabeth and her husband, Grand Duke Sergei, were first cousins once removed. And in fact, the majority of Nicholas and Alexandra's Romanov relatives had married in defiance of this canon. But with the emperor's permission, as the supreme episcopal authority of the Russian Orthodox Church, such a marriage was possible. Though Nicholas II could have approved this match, he refused to. Grand Duke Mikhail and Princess Beatrice were brokenhearted. They wanted nothing more than to be together, but Nicholas stood steadfast and refused to allow the first cousin marriage. It was likely the first occasion that Michael did not get his own way. Forbidden to marry B, he turned his attention elsewhere, and things got worse. In 1901, the Dowager Empress had appointed a lady-in-waiting to Grand Duchess Olga, her first. The woman, who you see here, Alexandra Vladimirovna Kosikovskaya, known as Dina, replaced the Grand Duchess's nanny, Mrs. Franklin, and became a central figure within the family circle, and soon she caught Mikhail's eye. She was no cousin, but she was a commoner and a completely unacceptable choice for a Grand Duke. After two years of a covert relationship, which culminated in rumors that an elopement was imminent, the Dowager Empress finally dismissed Kosikovskaya. Again, Mikhail was affected by the loss of his choice, but he was distracted, because by 1904, Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna had at last had a son, the Cesarevich and, Alex and Grand Duke Alexis Nikolaevich. Michael was no longer Cesarevich. He was third in line. Nicholas named him regent-in-waiting in case something should happen to the young heir and also made him a godfather. Michael was greatly relieved to no longer have to shoulder the burden of immediate succession. And with that in mind, Mikhail's perspective began to shift. If B had been an inappropriate choice and Dina had been an illegal one, what was to come next was going to shock everyone to their core and actually have serious ramifications for the entire imperial family. In this photograph, you can see Grand Duke Mikhail at the front and his sister, Grand Duchess Olga, on the hill at the back around 1907. Next to Grand Duke Mikhail sits Natalia Sergeyevna Wolfert. Natasha, as she was known, 
uh, was generally acknowledged to be one of the great Russian beauties of her generation. Born into a family of the minor service nobility, she was the daughter of Sergei Sheremetyevsky, a well-known Moscow jurist and lawyer. Eminently respectable, her first marriage was to Sergei Mamontov, who was a nephew of the Moscow industrialist and famed art collector Sava Mamontov. While Sasha was happy, well, while Natasha was happy with her first husband's social access, she noted later she was less than pleased with his financial situation. The two had a daughter, also called Natalia, but known as Tata Mamantova. And though Serge's uncle was fabulously rich, he was not. And his social cachet was dependent on his relationship to artists and musicians, many of whom, like Fyodor Shalyapin and Mikhail Vrubil, were devoted to Natasha. Natasha, however, was dissatisfied and began an affair with an aristocratic Petropolitan guardsman, Vladimir Vladimirovich Wolfert, and ultimately filed for divorce. Uh, for many of you who've read Anna Karenina, you know that divorce was impossible for women in Imperial Russia. And in fact, her husband, Mamontov, uh, posed as the guilty party in a case of adultery so that she would be granted a uh, divorce without any scandal. He maintained he was the guilty party and the divorce was ultimately granted. She married uh, Wolfert right away, and Natasha and her daughter moved to St. Petersburg, where they were quickly drawn into the imperial circle. You can see from this picture, she was at the center of it all. She's seated right here next to Grand Duke Mikhail, and behind them on the crest of the hill, you can see Grand Duchess Olga sitting with Colonel Nikolai Kulikovsky, who would ultimately become her husband in 1916 with the permission of her brother. By 1912, all of these people uh, would be living a very different life. The relationship progressed quite quickly, and though it was not consummated for some time, the rumors had reached Petersburg society that Natasha and Michael were, in were uh, involved with one another. So much so that Captain Wolfert, offended, challenged Grand Duke Mikhail to a duel, and Nicholas II sent Grand Duke Mikhail away to join another regiment. It's clear, however, that Michael and Natasha had indeed become lovers by 1909, and by December of that year, she was pregnant with his son, though she was still married to Wolfert. Mikhail appealed to Nicholas II, who was horrified, but helped arrange a negotiation with Wolfert, who agreed, like her first husband, to portray himself as the adulterous party and to divorce before the birth of their child. The divorce did actually not go through in time, and Natasha gave birth to their son, Georgi Mikhailovich, on 24th July 1910. The divorce on the instructions of Nicholas II was backdated so that their son would not be regarded as Wolfert's son, but as Natasha's own illegitimate child and therefore under her full legal guardianship. The emperor granted Natasha and George the right to live at Michael's Moscow estate, Brasova, and to use the name Brasova as their surname. Mikhail promised Nicholas II that he would never marry Natasha. He promised that she would remain outside of Moscow and that she would never be a source of any trouble for the imperial family. But in 1912, on a trip to Western Europe, the two were married in the Serbian Orthodox Church in Vienna on the Weitgasse, which is still there today. Here you can see a photo postcard of the Serbian Orthodox Church of St. Sava on the left, and a photograph of it on the right, uh, where you can see it is virtually unchanged. Uh, there's a note on the postcard in Michael's own hand, which reads, the church that we were married. As you can see, the church is unchanged. As you can also remember, there's another unchanged thing, which was the rule about Grand Dukes marrying without permission. Mikhail wrote Nicholas II about the marriage, and he said, I know punishment awaits me for this act, and I am ready to bear it. The Dowager Empress received a similar letter and wrote to Nicholas, this has completely killed me. I am undone. Maria Fyodorovna suggested that the whole wedding should be kept a secret and the marriage should be kept a secret as well because unequal marriages of the imperial family had been in the past, but it was too late and the consequences were swift. Michael and his wife, seen here with their dog, were banished from Russia. His military rank and positions were revoked. His palace, which had been under renovation since 1910, was confiscated. His funds from the imperial appanage were halted, his marriage was unrecognized, his son was unrecognized, and he was stripped of the role of regent to the Cezarevich. Quick decisions precipitated a move to Britain, his cousin George V allowed him to come into exile, and his relative Grand Duke Mikhail Mikhailich already lived there with his own morganatic wife, Countess de Torby, and their children. In Russia, Mikhail's first cousin, Grand Duke Kirill, had just been allowed to return with his wife, who was, in fact, B of Saxe Coburg's older sister. She had finally been recognized as a Grand Duchess, and their child was recognized as a Princess of the Blood Imperial. The fact stood out to Mikhail and seemed to prove that no matter what, 
his punishment would only be temporary. Michael and his family settled into what would appear to be a very pleasant exile. They rented Knepworth House, Knepworth House in Hertfordshire in 1913. And you can see here, life for the newly married couple was far from unpleasant. Michael and Natasha settled into a society, settled into a cycle of society visits, though the British aristocracy generally snubbed Natasha and generally referred to, preferred to receive only the Grand Duke. They spent most of their time with their children and their very close staff. Here, you can see Grand Duke Michael playing his guitar at Nebworth. He had an Italian guitar teacher called Domenici who traveled with him and his diary records lessons of playing the guitar almost daily. Who Domenici was and what happened to him is totally unknown. He's one of those mysteries and casualties of the war. Grand Duke Mikhail and Natasha Brasova also joined the ranks of the thousands of affluent Russians who frequented the Riviera and Paris in the period before the First World War. Here you can see from left to right, uh, Natalia Brasova and Mikhail Alexandrovich with an unknown woman and Mikhail's secretary, Nikolai Johnson. They are on the Quai des Anglais at Nice. Here is the fashionable Natasha sitting with Secretary Johnson on that same Riviera trip. Johnson was responsible for the diary, as we mentioned earlier. At the end of 1914, however, once war had been declared in August, Mikhail wrote an impassioned plea to Nicholas II, begging that he be permitted to return to Russia. I cannot bear the thought of being unable to serve my country at such a time. I beg you, he wrote, allow me to fulfill my duty. In this picture, you can see that Nicholas did relent. Here the whole family is reunited on the balcony of the Imperial family's rooms at the Alexander Palace. Michael's return, however, was politically difficult and awkward for all concerned. Though he was allowed back, there were still indignities. His funds were limited. He was not restored to his position as regent for the Tsitsidievich. He was not allowed to return to his own regiment, instead being assigned to a Dagestani regiment known as the Savage. In addition, his unfinished palace was not returned to him, and he and Natalia were limited to living on the estate of Brasova. In a final backhanded act, Nicholas recognized George Brasov as Michael's son and awarded him the title of Count Brasov in accordance with what had been done for the illegitimate offspring of members of the imperial family in the past. However, contrary to sort of the Western view, it appears Nicholas II never accorded the title of Countess to the boy's mother. Though people called Natasha Countess out of courtesy, it appears she had no legal right to that title. The imperial family still refused to receive her, and she was persona non grata, even during wartime. Mikhail, on the other hand, was quickly reintegrated into the imperial family and was placed on duty during the war. Here you can see him reunited with his mother, the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna, and his sister, Grand Duchess Ksenia, and their sons, and her sons. Neither the Dowager Empress nor Mikhail's sister would meet Natalia. They refused to call her Countess or even Madame Brasova. In a family correspondence, she was only referred to as that woman, his wife, or even La Brasova, in the same way that mistresses of the French kings or actresses had been called La Dubarry and La Bernhardt. Mikhail returned to fairly normal activities, even in wartime. And as an avid photographer, made frequent trips to Petrograd's Kodak Score, Kodak Store, which was located at Bolshaya Konyushinaya Street, number 19. You can see him here in front of the Kodak Store. Um, it's actually quite surprising at how normal life was during the beginning of the war. Natalia, however, was basically confined to Brasova, the estate near Bryansk. The estate had been inherited by Mikhail from his brother, Grand Duke George, and it was a pleasant country estate, or as the Russians say, Usadba, unpretentious and beautifully sited outside of Moscow. The couple made many improvements and decorated it without sparing expense. It was littered with objects from the imperial collections, but arranged in an informal way. Here are a few views of the interior. One can clearly see works by Barovikovsky, Kanova, and others. While Mikhail spent as much time as he could there, Natalia was mostly there by herself with their children, receiving a stream of sympathetic visitors from Moscow, including her family and friends, who were full of gossip concerning the state of the country and noting how quickly conditions were deteriorating. Mikhail took part in the war effort and was granted the St. Vladimir Medal with swords for his part in the 2nd Cavalry Corps during the Brusilov Offensive. He visited the troops wherever he went in an effort to boost the declining morale of the men who served. 
During one of those visits, he may have in fact presented a watch like this one, which is in the collection of the Russian History Museum. This watch by Pavel Bure, who was the court supplier of watches to the armed forces, appears to have been made during the period 1914-1918. More research is absolutely necessary, but you can see here Michael's imperial crown cipher on the presentation watch. Though Michael fought very well and very hard for the war effort, he was frequently able to get away from time to time in order to rest and to see his wife, his son, and his stepdaughter. In December of 1916, Michael was able to get away to a place that he and Natasha really loved to celebrate Christmas and the New Year. You can see here, Natalia also contributed to the war effort by funding hospitals out of her own funds. The Crimea was one of Imperial Russia's most beautiful resorts on the Black Sea coast, and since the mid-19th century, the Imperial family and the aristocracy had built spectacular homes in this beautiful location, now in Ukraine. Though this house that you're seeing, Swallow's Nest, was not a Romanov house, it is the backdrop against which our translation of Michael's diaries begins. It belonged at the time to the family of one of Michael and Natalia's dear friends, the Shilaputins. He and Natasha had been staying in the Crimea towards the month of December 1916 when the diaries opened. They had just finished their vacation and they were returning to Brasova when they learned of the murder of Grigory Rasputin from newspapers on the train heading towards Moscow. Michael and Natasha spent a worried Christmas at Brasova, gradually learning of the chaos which had erupted after the death of Empress Alexandra's spiritual friend, murdered by a group which included their relatives, Grand Duke Dmitri and Prince Felix Yusupov. The collective relationships of the Ramanov family were beginning to disintegrate. Nicholas and Alexandra were horrified by the murder, but even more so by a letter written and signed by many members of the family which begged for clemency for the two young men. The request was denied. No one has the right to commit murder, Nicholas responded. I am astonished you would make this request. After Christmas, on the 30th of December, Mikhail and Natasha moved to a rented house at Gatchina that he had taken for himself and his family in order to be nearer to the capital and try to make sense of the changing situation. In Petrograd, the situation was becoming desperate. Morale was at an all-time low, there were open rumblings of dissent against the government, and most particularly and aggressively against the Empress, who was believed to have extensive influence throughout the government. From the small house at Gatchina, Michael and Natasha would be increasingly aware that the situation was disintegrating throughout the month of January. On January 1st, Michael traveled from Gatchina to the Alexander Palace to meet Nicholas II, and together the two men went here to the Emperor's New Year reception at the Great Catherine Palace at Tsarskia Silo. Michael noted that the reception there was held as if it were in old times, though the Empress did not appear. After the reception, Michael went to the house of his cousin Boris. At Boris's English style house, Michael records he met with him and his cousins Kirill and Andrei Vladimirovich who, though Michael does not mention it, probably acquainted with him with their feelings regarding the family situation. They had all signed the letter asking for clemency for Dmitry Pavlovich and Felix Yusupov, and they were all feeling the sting of the emperor's anger and response to their request. The Vladimirovichi cousins may have asked Michael to visit their mother, the Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna the Elder, and two days later, on January the 3rd, Michael did. According to his diaries, Michael met with Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna and her sons at the Vladimir Palace on the English embankment. The family was concerned, they said, and suggested that he try to get a fuller picture of the disorders and difficulties from Duma chairman Mikhail Rezyanko. Michael may have also discussed Natasha and the refusal of women of the imperial family to receive her. Michael went from the Vladimir Palace to the home of Grand Duke Sergei Mikhailovich, and from there, the two went to meet with Mikhail Rezyanko. At the meeting, Michael asked Radzianko if he thought there would be a revolution, and Radzianko affirmed that the situation was tremendously serious and asked Michael to try to set up a meeting with Nicholas II in order to establish a government of confidence to try and replace the officials in whom the public had no trust. Radzianko noted that who should be placed at the head of this new government was himself. Michael returned to the house at Gatchina and spent the next few days dealing with his son, George, who had a serious case of influenza, and receiving visitors from Petrograd, including Prince and Princess Paul Putyatin, who brought him news of the gradual disintegration of the quality of life in the capital. Talk of revolution was everywhere, and the situation was getting worse. On January 12th, as he had promised Rodzianko, Michael went to the Alexander Palace and had breakfast with Nicholas and Alexandra here in the Palisander room. 
and then repair to have a private conversation with Nicholas. At two o'clock, Nicholas had a formal meeting with Michael, as well as with the princes Konstantin and Igor Konstantinovich, but there is no record of their conversation that day. Back in Petrograd, Michael and Natasha went to see Aunt Michin on the 14th. It was the first time any woman of the imperial family had bothered to receive Michael's wife. News of the meeting swept through St. Petersburg. Elizabeth Zizi Narishkin, a, confidence of the, a confidant of the Empress, who you can see lower right, wrote, I believe that danger is coming from an unexpected source, Mikhail. His wife, Natalia, is very much a member of the intelligentsia, and as such, she lacks any constraint. She's already wormed her way through to Maria Pavlovna. Her box at the theater is teeming with Grand Dukes. They will connive together with Maria Pavlovna. She will see to it that Natalia is accepted by the Dowager Empress and the Emperor. I sense that they're all plotting. Mikhail will, in spite of himself, be implicated in this plot. First, he will be regent. Then he will be emperor. They will accomplish everything. This type of gossip did not discourage the hopes of either Michael or Natasha. They thought that things would actually get better. And... It's interesting to note uh, Narishkina's point of view, because you can see that through her writing, almost everyone in St. Petersburg was convinced that there was a plot. By the end of January 17, Michael was working. He was sent to Moscow and took Natasha, leaving her there while he went on a final active tour of duty, which included time in Kiev with the Dowager Empress and other members of the imperial family who were working hard to assist the wounded at the Ukrainian-Polish-German front. Michael visited the 2nd Regiment and reviewed the troops, and by the time he returned to Petrograd on February 6th, he could see the situation in the capital was eroding. By the middle of February, the family's perception was that the Empress was the problem. The entire family, from the Dowager Empress on down through every branch, were convinced that Alexandra's influence over Nicholas was misguided and dangerous. We now know that the Empress's role was significantly less than anyone thought, and that she was in fact innocent of such intrigues. But the gulf between Nicholas and Alexandra and the rest of the family had grown so large that the family was getting their news from the same sources as the general population, which were newspapers. And so they suffered from the same misinformation about the Empress and her role as others. Grand Duke Mikhail, Grand Duke Paul, and Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich all met with the Empress at varying times and were shocked by what they felt was her seeming indifference to events. She refused to entertain any thoughts that there was any trouble in Russia that could not be resolved at the end of the war. On February the 22nd, Michael joined Nicholas and Alexander for breakfast and stayed until Nicholas II left for Mogilev at 2 o'clock. Michael returned to Gachna. On, December, on February 25th, disorders began in the capital. Michael noted that there were blockages in the street, that grenades were being thrown, and that in general there was disorder at all levels. On that day, the first strike broke out in response to the rumors of lack of bread and the optics of disorders in the street. 90,000 workers struck and took to the streets the first day. The next day, 100,000 workers, and the day after that, 200,000 more. Michael left Gacina immediately and arrived in Petrograd on the 26th of February and went, at Radzianko's request, to a meeting of the Council of Ministers. February 27th was the worst that anyone had seen, and Michael's diary reads, 27th February, Monday, beginning of complete anarchy in Gacina and Petrograd. At five o'clock, Johnson and I went to Petrograd in the extra train. At the Mariinsky Palace, I confirmed with Radzianko, Nyakrasov, Savich, Dmitryukov, then Prince Galitsyn, General Bilayev, and Kryzhanovsky arrived. By the time we got to Petrograd, it seemed quiet, but by nine o'clock, the shooting had started in the streets and almost all of the troops became revolutionary. The old power no longer existed. Because of this, a provisional executive committee was formed, which began to give orders and decrees in order to maintain the fragile order. This committee consisted of a few members of the State Duma under the chairmanship of Radzianko. At nine o'clock, I went to the Moika, to the war minister, and transmitted via a radio device to General Alexeyev to pass on to Nikki the steps that needed to be taken immediately to calm the brewing revolution, specifically the resignation of the entire cabinet, and to entrust Prince Lvov to choose a new one according to his own discretion. I added the response needed to be given immediately as time does not wait and every hour is precious. The response was as follows, do not make any changes until my arrival. Michael and uh, 
his uh, his team actually tried to get rooms in the Winter Palace, but they were forced away. There were enormous riots, and they finally found shelter at 12 Milionaya Ulitsa, Princess Putyatina's place, where they lay down on the sofas to get some sleep. By this time, the senior members of the imperial family felt that things really needed to be taken into their own hands. Grand Duke Mikhail, Grand Duke Kirill, and Grand Duke Paul, representing the senior most members of the House of Romanov, worked together to try to preserve the throne for Nicholas. They could see that in the capital, the imperial government was losing its authority so quickly that waiting for Nicholas's return might mean losing everything. A draft of a, peti of a, of a petition called the Manifesto of the Grand Dukes was drafted. It's unclear if the first draft was by Radzianko or if it was originally drafted by Ivanov, a, a lawyer of Grand Duke Paul's. But by the 28th of February, the document had been drawn up and signed by Grand Duke Paul and Grand Duke Kirill. The plan, it appeared, was to send the signed manifesto to Radzianko to transmit to the emperor for his approval. The men were to join the provisional committee at the Duma either on the 1st or the 2nd. Grand Duke Michael wrote to Natasha early on the morning of the 1st. I have signed a manifesto, which is supposed to be signed by the sovereign. On it were already the signatures of Pavel and Kirill, and now mine as the senior most of all the Grand Dukes. With this manifesto will begin Russia's new existence. It is possible that I will go to the State Duma today or maybe tomorrow. Michael did not go to the State Duma that day, and it is unclear what kept him from doing so. But Grand Duke Kirill, a signatory of the manifesto, arrived at the Duma at 4.15 in the afternoon with supplementary troops that had been requested earlier that morning. He found the place a shambles. Meeting Radzianko, he made the statement he was there to assist the Duma and to provide security and support for which Radzianko thanked him. But rumors began to fly that Michael would be made regent. On the afternoon of that day, Grand Duke Paul wrote to Kirill, this sudden new disposition to make Misha regent displeases me greatly. It is absolutely inadmissible, and it is possible that it may merely be the intrigues of the Brasova, or simply talk. Nevertheless, we must be on our guard and continue to do all that is in our power to preserve the throne for Nikki. If Nikki signs this manifesto, which we have sanctioned, the demands of the people and of the provisional government will be satisfied. Please speak of this to Radzianko and show him this letter. But neither Paul, nor Kirill, nor Michael knew that the manifesto had already been sidelined by Pavel Milyukov, and that elsewhere in the building, plans for the abdication of the emperor were being laid out with Michael as regent. On March the 2nd, the morning brought the news that the provisional committee had sidelined Rodzianko and all of his plans. The committee had decided to urge the emperor to abdicate in favor of his son with Michael as regent. The fact that Michael had been stripped of the right to the regency in 1912 was of no concern to the provisional committee. Nicholas was pressured from all sides, including Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich, and abdicated in favor of his son at 3 p.m. Kirill responded to Paul's letter from the day before with a letter. With regard to the matter which is troubling you, I can only echo your sentiments. I am absolutely of your view, but in spite of my entreaty to work together and in conformity with the ideas of our family, Misha communicates with Rodzianko. I have been left absolutely alone these days to bear responsibility for Nikki and the country. To save the situation, I'm forced to recognize the provisional government. Michael had indeed been contacted by Rodzianko that morning by telegram, but the contents of the telegram were unknown. In Pskov, Nicholas's concern for his son's health and the possibility that Alexis would be removed from his custody caused him to rewrite the abdication in favor of Michael. At 11 p.m., the document was changed with Nicholas abdicating in favor of his brother. The 11 p.m. document was back timed to three o'clock. Nicholas was no longer the emperor. Michael was awoken at the Putyatin's apartment at 6 a.m. on the morning of the 3rd with a phone call from Kirinsky that the Soviet of ministers would arrive at the apartment in one hour. In fact, they arrived at 9.30 a.m. The ministers arrived to plan out the future. There were an enormous number of consequences to weigh, and the stability of the provisional government was in question. Questions included, was it legal for the emperor to abdicate on behalf of his son? Could Michael, in fact, accept the throne? Were the acts of the provisional government even legitimate or legal at all? Two lawyers present, Vladimir Nabokov, the father of the famous author, and Baris, Baron Boris Nolde hammered out several preliminary drafts. The meetings went on all morning, and Princess Pusyatina was compelled to serve lunch to the entire provisional government assembled in the living room of her apartment. The final version of the document was not an abdication per se, 
but a deferral of the acceptance of power until such time that the Russian people were able, through free and fair elections, to choose a new system of government. Until such a time, Michael would say, he firmly placed all power in the hands of the provisional government. Michael copied out the statement in his own hand and signed it, saying, inspired in common with the whole people by the belief that the welfare of our country must be set above everything else, I have taken the firm decision to assume the supreme power only if and when our great people, having elected by universal suffrage a constituent assembly to determine the form of government and lay down the fundamental law of the new Russian state, invest me with such power. Calling upon them the blessing of God, I therefore request that all the citizens of the Russian Empire submit to the provisional government established and invested with full authority by the Duma until such time as this constituent assembly elected within the shortest possible time by universal, direct, equal, and secret suffrage shall manifest the will of the people by deciding upon this new form of government. Signed it. Uh, after the provisional government left, it appears that Michael, who was no longer regarded as emperor, received a late telegraph from Nicholas II, which had been transmitted at three o'clock. The telegram read, to his imperial majesty, Petrograd, the events of recent days have forced me to decide that I am resigned to this extreme step. Forgive me if this upsets you and that I didn't have time to warn you in advance. I will remain forever your loyal and faithful brother. I am returning to Stavka from where, after a few days, I hope to get to Tsarskia Silo. I desperately pray to God to help you and our motherland. Yours, Nikki. It was too little and too late. Learning of Michael's abdication later that day, Nicholas wrote in his diary, Alexeyev arrived with the latest news from Radzianko. It appears Misha has abdicated. His manifesto finishes with something about elections for a constituent assembly. God knows who advised, who advised him to sign something so vile. Rubbish. The answer to that question, who had asked him to sign it, was the team led by Radzianko, Prince Lvov, Milyukov, and Kerensky. Michael returned once again to the small house at Gatchina where he was met by Natasha. By the 12th of March, he noted that red flags were flying over Gatchina, much to his disgust. He and Natasha settled into a quiet and rather low-key life at their house outside the capital. They rode over the Gatchina Park in one of Michael's many automobiles, they went frequently to the silent pictures in Petrograd, and they awaited news from friends and family members. Nicholas returned to the Alexander Palace on March 9th, and his whole family was placed under arrest. On the 12th of March, Michael and Natasha learned that Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna had been arrested in Kislovodsk and that Boris had been placed under house arrest as well. On the 25th of March, the Dowager Empress, Grand Duchess Ksenia, and Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich were detained and prevented for leaving, from the Crimea, leaving for the Crimea. Michael and Natasha remained free and coordinated a move of his things from his rooms at the Anichkov Palace to his palace on the English embankment, which was apparently now available to him. They saw few people, went to Petrograd infrequently, and tried to follow the progress of the war with little success, as the news was both infrequent and inaccurate. Nicholas and his family were sent to Tobolsk in May of 1917. The Dowager Empress was subjected to searches in the Crimea later that month. Grand Duke Georgi Mikhailovich left for Finland in early June, followed by Grand Duke Kirill and his family later that month. By July, Bolshevik demonstrations against the provisional government were on the rise, and Michael and Natasha found themselves increasingly restricted. In August, he and Natasha were arrested, though they were released in September for reasons as mysterious as the initial arrest. When the October Revolution came, Michael was quite sick and debilitated from the progress of a stomach ulcer. By January 1918, the Constituent Assembly for which Michael had deferred the throne was met and immediately disbanded. Michael was no longer useful to the government, and in fact, constituted a threat sitting at Gatchina. Ill and depressed, Michael stopped keeping his diary. On March 11th, 1918, Michael was arrested and deported to the Siberian city of Piel. Natasha fought valiantly for his release in Petrograd, but was only able to secure permission to come and visit him for Easter. It was only in May 1918 that his diary resumed with her visit to Piel. They celebrated Easter together, and she stayed with him in his rooms at the Karadievsky Hotel until her departure. In May, he wrote, Got up around 8 a.m., and at 9 and a half, Natasha and I rode in a cab to the 2nd Pyrrhon station. Behind us rode Johnson and Yekaterina Danilova. 
There, we waited for the train on the platform for a long time. Ultimately, the Siberian Express was 36 hours late, as it was supposed to arrive in the evening of the third day. Sadly, Natasha got a seat in a small compartment of the international car with an unknown lady. The train arrived at 12 o'clock. Ten minutes later, Znamirovskaya also went. Natasha is traveling via Moscow, and I returned in a horse cab with Johnson. Stopped by the militia, then I sat in the little theater garden for a bit. After dinner, Johnson went to see Borogar unsuccessfully, while Znamirovsky stayed for another half hour. I played the guitar by myself. The weather was nice, partly cloudy, and 14 degrees. I felt very sad after Natasha's departure, so empty, and everything feels different, and the room seems different. Michael was allowed to walk around in Pyeong fairly freely, and here he is seen with his friend, the old police chief of Gachina Palace, Pyotr Ludvigovich Znamirovsky, who was also at Pyeong. This photograph is the last picture of Michael, who noted in his diary in June. After breakfast, I walked around town with Znamirovsky. We also stopped at the International Panopticon, wax figures. After tea, Johnson and I crossed to the other side of the Kama, where we took a short walk through the woods and returned by motorboat. In the evening, I played the guitar. Zdemirovsky and the Grand Duke saw a lot of one another in the last days until Michael was called to testify before the Chika. Throughout May, he was forced to sign in every morning with them and noted that his ulcer pains were coming back. On the 11th, he heard that Natasha was safely back at Gachina and he finished a diary entry on the 12th, noting that the weather was partly sunny and that it had rained a bit. On the night of the 12th, the Grand Duke's rooms were broken into and he and Nikolai Johnson disappeared. The Bolsheviks planted a story in the local newspaper, which read, The Abduction of Mikhail Romanov. On the night of the 12th, 13th of June, at the beginning of the first hour of the new time, three unidentified men in soldiers' uniforms arrived armed in the royal rooms where Michael Romanov lived. They entered Romanov's office and presented him with an arrest warrant, which was read by Romanov's secretary, Johnson. After that, Romanov was asked to go with the newcomers. He and Johnson were forcibly removed, put in a closed phaeton, and taken along Trade Street towards Obvinskaya. Members of the emergency committee, alerted by telephone, arrived at the rooms for a few minutes after the abduction. An order to detain the Romanov was immediately issued. Horse-drawn police units were sent out on all the roads, but no traces of him could be found. A search of Romanov's, Johnson's, and the two servants' premises yielded no clues. The abduction was immediately reported to the Council of People's Commissars, the Petrograd Commune, and the Ural Regional Council. Vigorous searches are being carried out. Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich and Nicholas Johnson were executed outside Pyeong in the early hours of the 13th of June, 1918. Their remains have never been recovered. The search for Michael actually continues today. You can see here Captain Peter Sarandinaki and his team, the search team, use ground penetrating radar and have worked to try and find Grand Duke Michael's remains since 2009. They're going to be going back to Pyeong this summer to look for him again. And today, the memory of Grand Duke Michael is actually very much uh, put to the fore in the town of Pyeong. A wonderful memorial chapel was built in his honor, and it's visited every year during the Tsarsky days, the, the royal days in July, when the imperial family is mourned. It brings us to the end of our lecture, and it's a good time to answer questions. I apologize to everybody for having uh, spoken so quickly, but there was so much material, I just didn't know how to get it all in. I will now stop sharing and go back to Michael.